Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Between Two Psalms with uh, Jesse Becker, and I'm Ron Edwards, Master Sommelier. Jesse is the uh, portfolio specialist for Craft and Estate. He does many things for them, helps them develop their portfolio, helps educate the staff, research and develop, not to mention goes out into the market and meets people like you and, uh, and gets the wines in front of you and talks to you about them. I'm the director of wine education for Winebow uh, corporately and nationally. And the reason we're on this call webinar together is we really like each other and we like sharing <laughs> information with you about wine in general and happy Earth Day to everyone. Happy um, Earth Day. Yes, happy Earth Day. So we decided that in honor of Earth Day, we would touch on the ever mercurial and perhaps even controversial argumentative topic of organic and biodynamic in the world of wines. So uh, Jesse, you ready to get started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for taking the time to um, talk about organic and biodynamic wines with us uh, today. Um, so, as Ron said, um, yeah, it's a, it's a topic that um, can sometimes even be a bit controversial, and, and definitely when we get into uh, biodynamics, I think it can um, it can be a little bit strange. Uh, definitely, some of the practices. Um, can be uh, on the mystical side, um, but um, there's a lot of great uh, wine producers all over the world who um, who practice biodynamics. Uh, and uh, here's here's Anne Claude Lefleur, uh, rest in peace. Uh, but she was a, a really um, passionate. Uh, uh, supporter of, of biodynamic practices. Um, and you can see her feelings there uh, is that, um, yeah, it's something that, that brings life to the, the soil, brings life to the vineyard. Um, and it's something that uh, definitely you can, you, when, and when you're in a biodynamic vineyard, you can pick up the soil and it just has a, it has a different uh, smell to it. It looks different. There's critters and worms crawling around in it. Um, and uh, I think that that uh, is something that we want to see uh, in our vineyards. And it's, it's because of biodynamics that, um, that this is the case. Um, so maybe a few, Jesse, yeah, Ron. Mm -hmm. That subject is so true. I was standing in this stark reality. I will not name the other uh, winery, but in Champagne, biodynamics is a little rare because it's a challenging environment to grow grapes to begin with. But I was standing in one of the vineyards that Leclerc Briand owns and there was a, uh, one row ends, of course, and then somebody else's property is the next row. That's the way it works on all of these great vineyard sites. And everything that was in Leclerc Briand's side was alive. It was early. It was uh, early. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I guess it was late fall. So we're moving into winter. The vines were dormant, but there was still green, beautiful grass. You know, the the land looked alive underneath their rows. And as soon as you left their row, two feet later you were in somebody else's property that's doing conventional vineyard management with sprays and, and it looked like the surface of the moon. It was oh, yeah. dead looking and uh, it was a very stark contrast. And so while there is great controversy over this, I agree with you when you're standing there and somebody practices one of these more earth friendly versions of viticulture, it, it gives a different feel to the yeah. whole environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Ron, uh, probably every vineyard in the world was farmed organically uh, at, at one point. Uh, so it's really only been since um, since the um, we we had these chemical scientists creating all of these um, chemicals to um, to apply to the vineyards that, um, that we really even have to uh, talk about this distinction of, of organic versus con conventional farming. Um, and that really sort of was popular, popularized uh, post-war period is when these um, chemical inputs like uh, synthetic uh, herbicides and pesticides became uh, popular for, for farming, for agriculture, and for for wine growing. Um, but we, we might be able to start, I think, actually with the Industrial Revolution here in the 19th century, uh, because this is when um, there's a there's sort of this exodus of, of people uh, leaving uh, the rural uh, areas, leaving farms, and going to the cities for, for work. And so there's uh, still the same amount of um, land and vineyard to, to farm and work, but you have to do it with fewer hands. Um, and so uh, part of this, um, just adapting these things like uh, synthetics uh, is, uh, is to farm more with, with fewer people. And so I think industrial revolution is a good, good place to start here. Um, 
Uh, Rudolf Steiner, we'll speak about him uh, in, a, in just a, in a little more depth in just a moment, but um, a very important part of this uh, presentation, um, who uh, was, a, was an Austrian philosopher, architect, um, studied holistic medicine, um, and got later into, into his career really into um, agricultural practices, but um, some of his ideas were put forth uh, in a series of um, presentations in 1924, uh, we were eventually put published. Um, but um, these these ideas about biodynamics really come from his um, his thinking, his writings, his uh, ideology. And so we'll we'll get to Rudolf Steiner here in a moment. Interestingly, that's between the two world wars, and it's sort of post. Uh, World War II that, um, as I said, these synthetics and al al agriculture, this sort of chemical farming becomes um, uh, popularized, popularized. And, and uh, we start to see then uh, sort of as a response to that in the 60s and 70s, some of the first uh, producers in, uh, in Europe start to uh, look at biodynamics and, and organic farming and sort of returning to the traditional uh, ways. Um, and then uh, by the, the 80s and 90s, of course, there were some really, really high profile uh, producers uh, like uh, Nicolas Jolie uh, in the Loire uh, who, who um, adapted these biodynamic practices. And so this is kind of how things have evolved and how we've gotten to this, uh, this point mm -hmm. where we are today. You know, but as you're getting to the next slide, let me remind everybody that if you have a question live, use the chat window. It's in the middle of your menu bar. We have it open. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. We got one or two by email early on that we'll address, but uh, other than that, organic, what does it mean? I think that that is probably one of the, one of the barriers, I think, to people moving into organic or advertising organic, even when they practice a lot of these things, is that it's pretty unclear at the end product line, especially in the U.S., what it means. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally think of it as that means that the, the land, uh, the vineyard in this case, was farmed without uh, any of these synthetic uh, inputs. So there's no mm -hmm. chemical, you know, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc. cetera, um, that, they, uh, that they've chosen to uh, work their land without these things. Um, and so it's, uh, of course, it means much it's much more labor intensive and it's, it's very costly to, to work this way. Uh, but uh, you're not putting these, um, these chemical inputs into, into the soil. Um, so that's to me what it, it generally means. Uh, but uh, if we want to really get specific about what it means, especially on the label here in the, the US, um, things are very, you know, very clearly, I think, defined uh, by the, the USDA. So you can see that um, if you see on a label, uh, USD, USDA organic wines, that of course means that um, the vineyard was farmed without chemicals, so it's um, at this um, national or organic uh, standard, uh, but uh, also they, they control what, um, how the wine is fermented, and so uh, without, um, without using any commercial yeast, so you have to either use the, the native uh, yeast or you, um, you're using a, an, an organic uh, non-GMO yeast, and you can see there's a, even a note there about um, sulfur, and there's none added. So when you see that on a label, USDA organic wines, there's no sulfur added. There might still be some sulfur there, uh, but it's something like, you know, 10 parts per million, whatever is just you know, natural yeah. in, That's the, in the wine. That's one of the differences, if I remember correctly, between organic European, organic US, is that the organic Europeans allowed to add sulfur to a certain level, whereas we are not to have that same label here. Yeah, it's maybe more along the lines of what we see here with uh, made with organic grapes. So we might see that on a label. Um, and again, so it's uh, farmed without uh, chemical in inputs, um, the little bit more flexibility on the uh, fermentation with the yeast. And you can see that it allows up to 100 ppm of uh, sulfur. Uh, so that's the, the big difference, the difference between a wine that's labeled USDA organic wine and then one made with organic grapes. You might find on a label somewhere written um, that they, they mentioned that they're uh, using organic vineyards. Um, that term is uh, controlled. It's a little bit looser and you can see up to 300 ppm of sulfur. Whew, that's a lot of um, uh, sulfur. Uh, and then uh, this is an interesting one which I've actually never seen but you might find on a label um, ingredients 
uh, organic grapes. It's a way of saying that um, it may not be 100% mm -hmm. organic grapes. And of course, there's, there's, that's the least um, restrictive of these, um, of these categories. So that's, that's what um, organic uh, means to me. I think what, what we'll spend most of our um, time on today is biodynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, this is where we get into some of this, I guess, uh, sort of mysticism. Hey, yes. Before we go on, this question that's been submitted is actually relevant to the organic more so than the biodynamic. Do you mind if we address it now? Sure. Okay, so Lindsay is asking, uh, I think Lindsay from New York is asking, it sounds like USDA organic wines are very similar to what many call natural wines what would the differences be between these two categories? And I, I think that's a, that's a very legitimate question. Yeah, um, well, I, I suppose that does fit the, um, the description of a, lot of, uh, of a lot of natural wine. I think when we, when we get to natural wine, and we weren't really going to dive too deep into that uh, today, but um, it's, I think, worth addressing. Um, it's usually an issue, a, ma a matter of sulfur, because a lot of most natural wine producers, I think, um, farm uh, organically. They're trying to not add anything additional to the wine. So then um, that would that would sort of uh, where we see yeast only using native or organic or non-GMO yeast. That that probably applies there, and then no sulfur. So that that might um, uh, fit the the bill for a lot of people. Um, you know, of course, we don't uh, at least in the U.S. have a certification for. Natural wine, very uh, interestingly, I, ju I just saw that um, France, uh, the INAO, now has an official category for natural wine, and they're, they're, they're dictating using two different labels, uh, one without any sulfur added at all, and one that adds that allows for a very minimal amount of sulfur. Uh, mm -hmm. But Lindsay's right, that, um, that would probably fit the bill for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that the natural wine movement, which is, you know, from my perspective, sort of like sticking it to the man sort of attitude, you know, uh, is all of a sudden now going to get regulated. That's hilarious. <laughs> There's a couple other questions here we'll come back to in a minute. Let's keep sure. going and, and don't let me forget to ask you, okay? Sure. Um, so biodynamic. Um, so of course, it sort of takes all of those ideas of, of organic farming, you know, farming without synthetic uh, pesticides, herbicides, fun fungicides, and fertilizers, etc. Uh, but we've added um, these, uh, some of these philosophical ideas of, of Steiner now. Um, and so um, I think really important to biodynamics is this, uh, this next point that the farm is a closed system. And uh, by that, I mean that um, it's supposed to be very sustainable your your crops provide the material that feeds the animals that are on the farm which produce the uh, manure uh, but and then that gets returned to the crops and I think we could um, come up with other examples of the, this closed system idea whether it's you know um, having natural predators on the, the farm to um, to take care of uh, insects or etc but it, the, the point is it's supposed to be this closed system um, yeah this is the part that um, is sounds a little strange for a lot of people the harness of, of cosmic energies, uh, but the, one of the best examples that um, anyone ever gave me of this, this idea or, uh, or theory is that if you think about um, how the, the moon, you know, um, pulls the tide in and, and out, um, it, and you think about how that might apply to the, the grapevine and, and wine growing, yeah, sap is probably rising and falling uh, within the vine uh, based on the, this, the position of the moon. And um, then it makes a lot of sense, like when you might go to prune, you might time that uh, with, uh, with the position of the moon. So um, I, think it, I think that um, sort of makes sense to me. And then um, th I think what a lot of people really focus on are these treatments. There's these famous sort of nine preparations. We can go through them all here in just a moment, but they are, um, they're of course using um, uh, materials from nature that um, are, are treated or prepared in a very specific way. And then they are either um, added to the, the vineyard uh, as, a, as a spray or uh, they're added to compost. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how they're applied to the, the vineyard. We'll, we'll get to those in just a moment. Yeah. So Jesse, I, I finally sort of picked up on this eventually because I was very sort of skeptical suspicious of the whole process of biodynamism when it was first brought to me. And, and then I started to think back about the way my, my grandfather raised his garden and he made teas out of manure and he um, planted and harvested by the cycles of the moon. And, you know, when my father was growing up in, his, in that man's house, uh, there was the theory that if you dug a hole on the waning moon, you would never be able to fill it back up. So this is not <laughs> 
new thought process in the world at all. And it has a source, of course, it's extremists, um, but you know, people have been acting and behaving and, and doing certain tasks in the agricultural world this way for millennia. It's, it's really a, like farmer's almanac stuff, isn't it? It's that kind of thinking. So once, once I wrapped my head around it that way, I was a little more comfortable with it. But I do have a story about Leclerc Briant that brings the cosmic energy to, to real life. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to tell that story or should we go on? Yeah, let's do it now. Why not? Because we're <laughs> going to talk about Nicholas Jolie, who is also uh, perhaps one of the initial extremists. Uh, so uh, recent vintages of uh, Champagne, especially with the uh, extreme warmth, they had uh, harvest with, with juices in the, it, going through, the problem was that most of the people in Champagne, their, their, their fermentations were going through mallow and regular fermentation at the same time because of, they weren't really sure why, maybe it, the grape juice was just riper than usual or whatever. And uh, when everybody runs out of answers, they go to our guy at Leclerc Briant, who's made you know 800 million bottles of champagne style wine across the globe and is a biodynamic um, guru. Guru, for <laughs> sure. You know, So they call him and he, and he tells them, well, the problem is, do this, this, and one of the, 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 the national sales manager was talking to us and he was like, so he went, I went and asked him, so why didn't our wines do that? Hmm. And he goes, well, I fixed it in advance. And he was like, yeah. well, what do you mean you fixed it in advance? He's like, well, fermentation is dictated by um, the moon and uh, mallow is dictated by Mars and this is the, and if you look at your cosmic cycles, you'll notice that this is the closest that Mars has been to the earth in 50 years. Wow. And so it's quite natural that our mallow bacteria would be getting messages from Mars, telling it to go ahead and get started, even when it was too early. And yeah. he said, well, how'd you fix it? And, and he said, well, I informed the fermentation that it wasn't time to go through mallow yet. And he goes, well, how'd you do that? Well, I put a rock out in the moonlight, I let it absorb the moon energy, and then I informed the fermentation tanks with it and he stopped there. So there are definitely uh, yeah. points of view here that make you go, really? But then when you taste that man's wine, you're like, well, yeah. okay, <laughs> I don't know if I can explain this, but it's really good. Uh, so I want to go to Jolie. I've heard I've heard uh, uh, several biodynamic wine uh, growers, wine producers, uh, say that it's more, it, working biodynamically is like being you're on the uh, offensive, like you're planning ahead, you're thinking mm -hmm. ahead to what uh, the problems might be, and you're solving right. them then rather than having a, a response to them. And so, um, well, uh, somebody asked us a question via mm -hmm. email about uh, Nicolas Jolie and why the wines are so. Um, long lived and so so um, uh, so famous and well known. Um, it's a it's a great great terroir. Um, it's a seven year, of course, and uh, one of the um, I guess you know we'd say classic producers of of the Appalachian. Um, but uh, somebody that very early on embraced uh, biodynamics. I think in '86 he had uh, fully converted uh, Coulis de Sorant to uh, biodynamics, and it was just a very very vocal person about bi uh, biodynamics and went out into the world. Uh, with uh, with his colleagues and and told them about it with through his Renaissance de Terroir group um, and um, uh, but uh, there's so many stories about Nicolas Jolie's wines um, you know I I visited the estate back in 08 and I thought the the 07 vintage that I tasted there was just fantastic you know so fresh at that point his daughter Virginie had um, started to uh, be involved um, and since that time uh, I think the last vintage I remember tasting was 2012 and it was very oxidated. It, um, it was had that really yellow color. So um, I, you know, something that people say about his wines is that um, it's for him almost more about biodynamics than, than the wine itself. So I don't know your experience, Ron. Um, I think the I think um, I could get myself in a lot of trouble here. So I will just I will just approach it this way. Um, the region, the reason Jolie's wines are ageable is the reason that Beaumard's wines are ageable, and it has nothing to do with biodynamics. It has everything to do with Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc, yeah. Chenin Blanc is a high acid, high extract grape when in that terroir, which makes it naturally ageable. 
Um, you know, Bomard does not practice biodynamics. I don't think they're even organic. Um, but when you taste those wines with age, they age very, very gracefully. Um, Nicolas Jolie wines have that uh, very um, sort of hands-off kind of approach style wine where um, some people will tell me they've had just magical experiences with it. And then other people will tell me that it was kind of like, eh. um, yeah. So that's been uh, my experience. I think he thinks that's part of the mystique and that's his philosophy and he's welcome to that. He certainly has helped the rest of the world get a little further along with biodynamics, which I think in the end has been a good thing. Yeah. Well, here's, uh, here's the, um, what biodynamics is really based on, these, um, these ideas, these writings, the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Austrian grew, uh, or spent most of his uh, adult life, at least in uh, Germany, uh, and gave a series of uh, uh, lectures on this, uh, these ideas of farming in this holistic uh, way, which we just described uh, in 24. Um, and uh, so biodynamics sort of grew out of this in the, in the uh, decades that followed and uh, all of the, his followers are really the ones that developed um, this system of, of biodynamic farming. And so part of it is farming with the lunar calendar, which we already touched on, but you want to do certain things, certain tasks in the vineyards at certain times based on the position of the moon and other um, things of the cosmos. So um, harvesting, you're supposed to do harvesting on fruit days and uh, watery, well, I guess if you water is supposed to be added on leaf days. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's part, it's part of all of this. Um, and what I wanted to really get to here is the, um, are these uh, treatments, because um, I think this is what um, a lot of people are really interested in. These are sort of like, you have to think of these as like herbal teas almost, um, using a specific, very um, specific herbs and um, flowers and uh, different things of nature and treating them uh, in a certain way. And then eventually um, you take a very small amount of this material uh, that you get from, from this and uh, you dynamize it. And so this is the process of dynamizing. You actually um, you add a very small amount of this material to water and then um, uh, you stir it and you create this vortex. And this is what brings energy and life to this, um, this mixture, which is then applied to the vineyard through a, a spray. And this is famously the, the preparations 500 and then uh, 501. And some of these, um, I, I, like, I like reading these out loud because they get kind of strange. So the, this, is the, the, this is one of the most famous, the 500. Um, you take a manure from a lactating cow and you place it inside a cow horn and you bury it during the winter. Uh, you dig that up and then um, you dynamize it, you, as you just saw, and uh, you make it into a, a tea. And this is supposed to um, stimulate uh, the, the life in the, in the soil and to, to encourage root growth. Yeah. And along those same lines is this uh, preparation 501. This is another one that you, um, you dynamize with, uh, with water um, and then you, you use it sort of as a spray. You basically make a tea out of this. Um, this one's based on, uh, I guess, silica. And it's the same thing. You bury it in the ground and um, uh, this, is, this is just part of the, the preparation. Um, the other ones are uh, uh, applied to the vineyard uh, through, um, through compost. Uh, and this is a, another really important part of these um, preparations and treatments is, um, is composting. It's, it's part of that um, keeping, keeping things in a uh, contained system, uh, in, in a, a biodynamic uh, idea. Uh, and uh, even, the, even the manure here is really supposed to be from, from uh, cows who, are, um, uh, who only have an uh, organic diet. They're supposed to be from within a, a certain radius of the, mm -hmm. of the farm. Um, and uh, so you prepare these, um, this compost and then these other preparations, some of these get really strange, like this is 502. Um, you take yarrow flowers and you stuff them into a deer bladder, uh, which is dried in the sun and then buried over the winter and it's added to compound. Uh, compost to um, to aid in the absorption of nutrients in, in soil from soil. So is there now a big market for, for instance, New Zealand red deer is a uh, farm raised and <laughs> yeah. for for food, and so I guess now they have a a serious market for their deer bladders. Uh, what as a break in here, so we can absorb that last one because that, <laughs> one, that one's wild. Um, there's a couple of questions here that are rel related to each other. Basically, the idea of organic or biodynamic in a shared vineyard situation like Burgundy, like, uh, like nor Northwest Italy, like Champagne, is that really possible? 
Um, my experience from looking at it says it is. You don't necessarily have to have an organic or biodynamic neighbor next to you in the three, uh, three rows that adjacent to yours to still be farming biodynamic. You want to address that real quick and then we'll move on? Oh, I understand the question. You mean what, uh, why would like, for example, Leclerc Briand, they farm a small parcel organic yep. biodynamically and then their neighbor. Um, it is, I mean, that, that question comes up a lot. I think, um, I think the producer, uh, the grower, the wine grower, the producer is doing what they believe is right. Um, and uh, uh, they don't really have any control over what their, their neighbors do. Now, um, you may be able to show your neighbors the results um, in terms of quality and the, the, um, the health that your vineyard has. Um, and, and I think it sort of grows and spreads that way um, mm -hmm. by convincing your neighbors that you're doing the right thing. Uh, but you may be a, a loner there for a while. I think um, we, we see that a lot. And sure, if they're treating their vineyards right next to yours with chemicals, of course, some of those chemicals are, are coming over to yours. And um, I don't, I don't, that's a tough one. Yeah, but you're yeah. still, you are still better off with your rows. A little bit of overspray versus direct spray is going to be a yeah. thing. And having, yeah. you know, having that experience of looking at one row to the next in Champagne, and it was mm -hmm. very clear that this was a healthy, vibrant, live, living soil, and this was apparently not, or at least on the outside looking in. Yeah. Uh, I think that there is enough difference that it's worth the effort, and people still get certified in Burgundy as biodynamic, even though all the plots are shared. So they, yeah. must, they must be able to do it. Now, 503 is a little nicer because it involves chamomile flowers, but you've got to stuff them into a cow intestine and dry it in the sun and bury it over the winter. Uh, but it's for stabilizing calcium and nitrogen. 504, stinging nettles. Um, so these are, these are, the, these are the nine um, treatments that we're going through. This one's an interesting one. You take oak bark and you stuff it inside a skull of a farm animal. Uh, you store it, away, store it away for the winter, um, and then you, um, you add it to the, the compost uh, later where it uh, is supposed to ward off diseases and it prevent excessive plant growth. growth. Um, dandelion flowers here with 506 um, for the uptake of potassium. 507 valerian, that's uh, at least a pretty, a pretty picture there. Um, but you press it into a juice, they use this little hand crank. I, I've seen this in, in action. It's a little hand crank um, press. You press it into a juice that's then um, uh, added to compost. Um, and uh, 508, yeah, horsetail. Um, so yeah, for fighting fungal infections. And then um, this is a famous one, 509. So you, you hang a piece of raw chicken in the still during distillation, and then you cook the chicken with the heat from the steam, and then um, the meat, the fat, and juices drip into the distillate. Do you know about this one, Ron? Yeah, that's my favorite preparation for joke. <laughs> Just kidding. Just, that's Pachu. That's that's called a pachuga. That's just a that's just a lie. That was just a joke. All right. Um, so perfect though. <laughs> so Olivia Olivia Humbrecht here's another very high profile uh, producer from from Alsace who um, who obviously really believes in um, in biodynamics, um, and I, I think this is also part of the uh, part of it is that um, it's not necessarily that um, biodynamics can be measured. Uh, through science, and it's it's hard to kind of um, prove it in that way. But um, they see the results, and here's here's sort of what um, he has to say about it. When your children are sick, and then they drink a chamomile tea, and it, it um, uh, soothes their their stomach, then you accept it that it works. You can't explain it, but you accept it. And I think it's the mm -hmm. same sort of idea behind biodynamics. Yeah, that was actually uh, one of my favorite learning experiences about biodynamics was actually in. Uh, Australia at Paxton Vineyards and the, they're a biodynamic estate and it's a big estate like hundreds of acres mm -hmm. and um, the winemaker was just or the venue manager was very plain about it he was I don't understand how it works I, I can't even guarantee you that I could prove it works mm -hmm. but I can tell you my vineyards are better and my grapes are better since I started doing this and I was like and so I just accept it and he didn't even try to explain it through mystics mysticism or even yeah. science he just said my empirical data is my vineyards are healthier and my grapes are better 
Yeah. So um, how about certification? Because uh, it's, uh, we should definitely talk about this because um, there's plenty of uh, producers farming organically and biodynamically without um, certification. Um, and, uh, but uh, the Demeter is definitely the most uh, known. It's, um, they probably have a, about 500 producers certified in Europe, and uh, I think there's about 80 or so here in the U.S. Um, that have this certification. It's quite strict, and you know, uh, Demeter is a, a certifying body for all biodynamic agriculture, so you can buy Demeter certified cheeses and tomatoes and all, all sorts of things, and this is, um, uh, this is one of the things that, one of the criticisms is that you'll hear from producers is that it's, it's um, quite restrictive and, and they, um, they want you to follow things very strictly, so you have to apply these uh, applications to the entire farm, even if uh, uh, you think, uh, well, this block doesn't need anything right now, um, this block needs something else, uh, Demeter is very strict about um, how they want you to take care of the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the farm. So, um, but uh, it's the one that has, it's probably the most uh, known and uh, um, has the most um, uh, producers certified under their, mm -hmm. under their guidelines. Um, so that, this slide actually deals with um, the, the vineyard, uh, but uh, there's some, of course some um, things they uh, ask that you do in the, the cellar also, or, or control, um, and there's a, you can see there's a limit to um, sulfur additions, you have to use indigenous yeast, um, and um, uh, they're still allowed to use uh, bentonite and egg whites for fining, but those have to be um, uh, biodynamic eggs, of course. Um, and a couple of other um, certifying bodies. Um, this uh, Bio de Van is um, something you see mostly with uh, French producers, so based in, in France. Uh, and um, they, both of these that you see, Respect and this uh, Bio de Van, they're certifying bodies for biodynamics, but um, they apply specifically to wine. I think that's what's important about them. Respect is based in, in Austria. Uh, they have uh, about 30 members or so, um, but they're, and they're mostly uh, German uh, wineries and Austrian wineries, uh, but um, they follow the, the um, um, ideas of Steiner. Uh, there's, there's rules that they need to upkeep because this is a, a certification, but it applies specific, specifically to wine and their, their specific needs at their uh, farm. So. Okay. No. Um, so uh, this gets to something I think you were, you were speaking about, Ron. Uh, this is Fritz Wieninger's take on biodynamics, who was a skeptic for sure. This is, a, this is the leading producer in uh, uh, Vienna. Um, I'm not an organic junkie. I'm just doing, I'm doing this for quality and I'm achieving quality through biodynamic farming. So he was eventually uh, convinced by his, uh, he's a respect uh, member and he was convinced by his colleagues in respect that this was the best way to achieve quality. And so, so that's I, think, why he... I think that sort of answers Stephanie's question because she said, are there growers that have tried to compare biodynamic and traditional growing practices to see the difference? And I think vinegar is one of those people that he was doing one thing mm -hmm. and it moved, not all at once, because you can't do it all at once, to something else. And he feels like the quality improved. And yeah. then um, a question from Stephen, um, was a question about tasting, the idea of tasting on certain days and so forth. And um, I'll go ahead and address that. I have my own personal view of it, but. Okay, I wanna hear your take on it, but um, I have the, uh, the, the, the app, the what, I think it's called what wine. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, this is uh, based on that, um, that biodynamic lunar calendar. And it says yep. that um, certain days are root days and others are flower days and others are fruit days. And they, the wines um, express themselves in different ways based on the, the um, position of the moon, mm -hmm. cosmos. Um, I have to say, I mean, I think that fruit days are better days to taste wines than root days. They seem more um, uh, alive and more aromatic and more uh, vibrant with fruit. So uh, I, I've, I've actually seen some results that say this is, a, this is a, a true, but Ron, what is your take? Well, I don't have that app. I don't pay any <laughs> attention to it whatsoever. Um, I'm not saying that it might not be real. Uh, I just take wines for what they are in front of me um, on a regular basis. I don't mind the idea of it. I think yeah. sometimes it's used as a crutch for a wine that probably isn't very good to begin with. I think it's sometimes used for a crutch for those of us who are tasting and are having a bad day. 
and we don't want to look internally and realize that we're having a bad day because of what's going on inside of us as much as anything else. Yeah. And if it's used in those two fashions, I don't really like the discussion. If it's used in a more purist format and you're actually doing some sort of empirical feeling research about it, and uh, in talk, especially if you're dealing with the same wine, like I yeah. taste this wine, I'm going to do a little experiment, especially if it's stealth enclosure, so you don't have a, a variation in whether this one has such a low level of TCA that it's really not affecting it other than it makes it dumb. You know, that sort of thing drives me crazy, but uh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Well, go. hey, um, so we're, we're going to end on this note, and I am, um, there are so many great, great producers um, working with biodyna biodynamics, both certified and those that uh, uh, don't pursue certification that I'm almost embarrassed to put this up because there's so many great biodynamic producers in Italy and they're now in Australia. And um, I just uh, sort of more off the top of my head put this mm -hmm. together. So you can see some great, great names here um, uh, who have been working this way. Um, the feed, I mean, um, DRC, there, there's so many great estates that um, uh, we could have added here. So uh, it just, I think, um, reinforces the idea that um, uh, there are many, many wineries that feel they're getting um, the positive results they want from this, from working this way. And uh, it's certainly, um, from my viewpoint, uh, something that's better for the environment. And um, uh, so I like uh, this sort of feels right to me when I, when I'm out shopping for wines, I'm looking for organic and biodynamic producers mm -hmm. myself. So, um, I know, um, we want to take a few minutes to answer a few more questions. Someone did email a, a question, um, and was asking about when you're, when you're out selling the wines, Ron, mm -hmm. um, you know, he get, they get the question, why, uh, buy or drink a biodynamic or organic wine rather than a, I guess, conventional wine. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Is, I guess the question is, is the quality better? Mm. The, a lot of these producers believe that, but I think it's also um, for the same reason for me, uh, I, I choose to um, buy organic fruits and vegetables when I shop mm -hmm. at the grocery store. I just sort of like that uh, idea better than the, the conventional stuff. But what do you think, Ron? I think it's, uh, it's one of those interesting conversations that thank goodness if the buyer brings it up to you, right? Like, hey, I'm looking for biodynamic, then, then you know um, that they're good with this and that the conversation is going to be positive. But to, it can, this conversation can be very off-putting to some and very embracing to others. So you need to sort of gauge your audience a little bit. And I, and I apply that not only in, in the world in which we work now, where we're selling more or less to someone who's selling, but also that in, that in sommelier or the retail professional that's handing a bottle over um, understanding what the person's really looking for is important and asking them, do you shop organic? You know, is this important to you? Because I think the overall quality of the end product as of yet, I mean, we see some great producers here, right? But we could list some other great producers that are also super well regarded that aren't biodynamic and still are super well regarded. So I don't think we're really talking about in product quality. Yeah. We are talking about a holistic approach to the idea of end product quality, which is definitely better for planet Earth. Yeah. Um, and um, so I think it's an approach where you're talking about being a holistically responsible sort of idea to the idea of the wine you consume. Um, it's, a, it's a slippery slope when you start down that path because, well, it's in a glass bottle and that was expensive to ship. And what about the green footprint and all that stuff? So it, it's yeah. a really complicated conversation. But if you can get them down the path of this person really takes care of the land, I yeah. think that's a really great conversation to have. Um, and I, with just a few minutes left, I wanted to, I see two questions here yep. um, regarding vegan wines. Um, yep. So how does, how does biodynamic farming work with vegan wines? Um, they're both kind of getting at the same thing. Um, you know, vegan, and we just saw that, for example, in Demeter's certified wines, they allow um, uh, fining with egg whites. We're really talking about with vegan, um, the fining process, because um, uh, not only are egg white, whites used, but some, you know, very traditional thing would be to use isinglass or like, um, like fish bladder. And this is for fining to make the wine uh, clear. Uh, and really, that's the, um, that's, the distinction uh, the, is this um, material used for fining. So um, uh, I think we have to s 
separate those are two separate questions is this wine biodynamic or organic yes or no and is it vegan they're they're not necessarily related uh, to me because we're talking about right. a process that's allowed in in, um, in even demeter certified biodynamic wine sometimes they intersect sometimes they don't right exactly um, and then um, if you can think of any wineries that make a pet net biodynamic wine, I'm sure they exist, um, but I'm, it's not on my immediate radar. That was another question. Um, do you have anything right off the top of your head? Nothing came to mind for me. But, oh, uh, you're, ask, you're, you're asking the wrong guy, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm just the wrong generation or whatever. I, I just don't, I, I'm not sure if I can, I'd have to go research that for sure. Um, here's like, let me see if this one, um, ah, I think we kind of covered this, that one on the 10 second elevators bitch, but here's a, here's a, um, here's a question from Hi Tran. Hey, hi, nice to hear from you. Haven't seen you in way too many years. Can you speak on the general, speak generally on the economics when farming conventionally versus organically versus biodynamically? I think the reality is it's just more expensive and time consuming to do it without what we now call conventional, which is why conventional became popular. But Jesse, you want to address it? Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, sometimes the, uh, the, the people that the detractors, I guess, of biodynamic and, and even organic farming, um, one of the things you'll sometimes hear is, uh, is um, yeah, but uh, I, if I can farm my uh, vineyard uh, more profitably, uh, by occasionally uh, uh, using a, a spray, a chemical spray, uh, then am, am I not uh, more sustain sustainable in that way? Because um, I can be, I can make a profit. I can pay um, a, a fair wage to my employee. You know, you hear these arguments. Um, so um, to the answer to the question, I see a few people asking this. I think mm -hmm. definitely it absolutely is more expensive to farm uh, this way, to work this way. Um, um, so that's that's that. It's you're you're spending more time in the vineyards, more man hours, more um, more labor, for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So Jeff, yeah, we've Jeff is asking again about um, vegan. If uh, if unfined wines are considered vegan, vegan, uh, I just can't. I can't think of another animal product that would be I ex except in the the bio, biodynamic preparations that we just spoke about and we're stuffing um certain you know flowers and uh, herbs and things into a deer stomach <laughs> um i suppose that also um uh would sort of disqualify it as vegan but uh as far as the winemaking practice is the the only thing that really is is common is the process of fining with like right. an animal product egg whites right. so unfine might be vegan but if they don't say so on the bottle then we really can't tell the customer it's not that it's vegan so hmm. um we can tell them it's unfined which means they probably didn't add any animal products, but unless they want to state it, that's a dangerous, dangerous mm, yeah. road to go down. Um, oh, so here's a great question from, from Bill. Do, dyno, do biodynamic practices bleed over to vineyards not doing uh, biodynamic practices? And the answer is, it depends on the, the one next door. If the person next door is heavily spraying and constantly killing whatever life is creeping over then no but if like the person next door is organic and you know then the, the living nature of the soil that you're creating in a biodynamic vineyard is going to spread uh through the course of time i would say that that would be my take on it for sure yeah great all right um very fun uh, speaking with you today, Ron, about Please. biodynamic and, and organic wines. Um, we hope this was, uh, we provided some information that um, is useful and helps uh, you um, um, have better, sort of better understand these categories. We love um, all of the questions and uh, hopefully we've gotten to most of them. So I want to say thank you for everyone and um, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Great to hang with you, Jesse, even if it's through the miles and only digital. Hopefully we'll be in person one of these days soon. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you being with us today. And we'll see you next week for Chianti Classico, right? 
Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait for that. Not Thank you. Glasgow, it shall be. Talk to you soon, everybody.